Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I see that you're in rare form this morning. How are you doing? All right. Well, welcome to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this session this morning, we're going to discuss the importance of entrepreneurship and business ownership and the enormous positive economic impact of hip hop for the black community and for the whole economy. We will be joined by Mr. Sean Combs, who many of you know as Diddy, P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, <laughs> and a group of business leaders from Combs Enterprises who will share their experiences and insights. Some of you may know that in the 90s when others were trying to stifle and silence rap music, particularly gangster rap, I was speaking out in defense of it because I don't believe in censorship and because I recognize the creativity and the economic opportunities that hip hop music was creating for this country and for black people. I remember uh, some of the groups like NWA uh, and how they got their start, creating music you know, in the garage, in the basements, straight out of Compton, all of that. It was happening on the East Coast and the West Coast and they were selling this music out of their cars, out of the back window of their cars. MTV wouldn't play their music. Uh, the police wanted to shut them down and even the FBI went after them. But the music just took off. And while hip hop started, basically I believe on the East Coast, it better because that's where Sean is from, so that's what I better say. <laughs> <laughs> the hip hop spirit exploded, not only in the East, West, and in the South, with rappers inspiring each other from afar and developing sounds and a style of music never heard before. The majority of this country never imagined uh, that rap music would become the global phenomenon and the economic success that it is today. Hip hop spawned this widespread creativity where it was no longer just about rap but also about the shoes, the clothes, the whole culture and style. Think about all of the jobs that hip hop has created beyond just recording artists, jobs in production, publicity, management, accounting, design, choreography, security, entertainment, law, and many other occupations. Now, some of the hip hop artists and producers who were just starting out uh, when we were having those censorship debates in the 90s have today become prominent business moguls. Several hip hop stars have built businesses, business empires spanning across multiple industries, creating jobs and wealth building opportunities, uh, not only in the black community, but all over the United States of America and contributing substantially to the growth of the US economy. So according to Forbes, the hip hop economy now generates more than $10 billion a year, but I suspect it's even more. The movement has transcended music and encompasses fashion, new media, television, film, food, beverage, advertising, and many other industries. It is a vital engine of wealth building and economic growth. This is important because of the racial wealth gap in our country which I'm keenly aware of. As ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee, on average, African Americans and Latino families certainly have lower incomes and less wealth than white families. These are real disparities which much must be addressed. On a basic level, families need a steady income to meet daily needs and expenses, but in order to achieve long-term economic stability and prosperity, our communities must also have opportunities to save and accumulate wealth. The entrepreneurship demonstrated in the hip hop economy is a critical part of building intergenerational wealth and prosperity. And they are closing this wealth gap. I'm so pleased and proud 
than entertainers like Sean Combs not only understands the importance of their talent, but also learn that there is value in their style that has helped to generate new business opportunities. I'm especially proud of Sean as he has emerged as one of the most successful businessmen in the hip hop industry. Today, he will tell us how it happened and how he recognized the opportunities and how he took them. But before we bring him out to tell the secrets of his success, we're going to hear from this distinguished panel of business and industry leaders on how they're continuing to build a vital part of the hip hop economy. So with that, I'd like to start with introducing our very special guest here today. Now, many of you who have attended these sessions that I've held in the past, you know that we've had some of the traditional businesses and we have had, um, we've had uh, success stories uh, from many uh, African Americans who have done well, uh, but I have not heard the real discussion and the appreciation for the contributions of the hip hop industry um, discussed even on Wall Street uh, as a member of the Financial Services Committee and a ranking member, I want to elevate this discussion, not only so that real <coughs> credit is given, but so that we can understand the new opportunities and begin to think about niches and thinking about how we can use our individual creativity. Many folks who have been successful in business in this hip hop industry uh, didn't know that their ideas, their style, their thoughts were marketable. And that's what I want you to start to think about. Not just some of the old industries where you're begging people uh, to afford you capital so you can get started. There are other ways to do this. And so with that, let me introduce this panel. Before I do that, I know that we're going to be joined uh, by some of the members of Congress who will be in and out today. But the first one is Representative G.K. Butterfield from front row left. Please stand. I'd like to start with uh, a gentleman that I consider just a good friend. Someone uh, that I can call and many others call for advice or for consultation of her help. And every time I have called this gentleman, he has responded positively and quickly. He knows how to make quick decisions, fast decisions, and he knows exactly what you're asking him for and about. And so I'm very pleased to introduce someone that many of you know, Mr. Andre Harrell. Vice Chairman of Revolt TV and Media. Andre Harrell serves as Vice Chairman of Revolt TV and Media, an entertainment powerhouse with credentials spanning film, television, music, and branding. Andre has helped influence and create urban and millennial culture around the world. In this role, Andre helps create new opportunities for Combs Enterprises with technology companies, brands, and the music industry, largely focusing on business development, outreach, and strategic partnerships. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and I want you to know that many of you not only have heard about him, but you know about him. And Andre, you're going to have to be careful because they're going to surround you when you leave here. Everybody's got a business idea, and that's what we want to hear. OK, so um, we are going to have um, Ms. Dia Sims, President Combs Enterprises. Dia Sims, an executive, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and creative force. As president of Combs Wine and Spirits, she oversees the strategic execution of all Chirac Ultra Premium Maca, De Leon Tequila, and Spirits Innovation Projects for the company. Dia, 
has worked with Sean Diddy Combs since 2005 and brings her relentless commitment to excellence and her unparalleled track record as a creative strategic marketer to the leadership team of Combs Enterprises. Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> And so I want you to meet Derek Ferguson. He is the Chief Growth Operator, uh, Officer at Combs Enterprise. He joined the company in 1998 and has been a trusted advisor to Mr. Combs ever since, serving as CFO and managing all business operations for Mr. Combs and his brands. Derek has helped to develop some of Mr. Combs' most important deals including negotiating a distribution contract from Comcast for Revolt TV, the acquisition of Inez, I believe, is that? Inez? Inez. Inez. Oh, clothing from Liz Claiborne. The successful launch of Sean John Clothing, launching Blue Flame Marketing, negotiating several joint venture deals, and involving Bad Boy Records. Give them a big round of applause. Okay, Jeff Tweedy, President and CEO. Sean John, Jeffrey Tweedy. Jeffrey Tweedy is President and CEO of Sean John, the award-winning clothes and lifestyle brand founded by Sean Dick Combs, along with Mr. Combs. Jeff is a founder and has been with the brand since its inception. He is one of the most recognized and highly regarded leaders in the fashion industry and is celebrated for his sharp insights, strong creative vision, and an acute ability to predict shifting trends in the industry. So would you give him a big round of applause? And so today, uh, we're going to have a moderator who really understands these businesses and understands a lot about how they evolved and may be able to even talk about projections, but also uh, ask questions of our panelists that will help get the information out this morning that you want to hear about how they do it what it all means, and maybe with some advice from many of you who are so very interested in how you can get involved in some aspect of these businesses. So his name, our moderator for today, is Jeff Burrows. He will be our moderator. <laughs> he is the founder and CEO of What Works Brand Strategy, where he leverages his pop culture expertise to bridge the gap to cultural relevancy for a multitude of brands. They have created strategy for Moet Chandon, Hennessy, Dr. Brandt, Aquadrate, Harry Belafonte's Sankofa Original Music Initiative, which is using art to shed light on injustice. Jeff has previously served as Executive Vice President of Bad Boy Entertainment and Senior Vice President of Sony Music. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like for you to give a big round of applause to all of our panelists uh, who are here today uh, to help us uh, become knowledgeable about these businesses, about uh, how hip hop has contributed to this economy. And so with that, a big round of applause for all of our panelists that are here today. I know you're wondering where Sean Combs is. <laughs> We're going to have this discussion. We're going to have some questions and answers. And we're going to have a video clip. And then we're going to have the president, uh, the presence of Sean Combs uh, come in. And we're going to do I'm going to do an interview with him, and we're going to have a discussion. And so, if you are waiting for him to come from the back right now, <laughs> calm down, get comfortable. Are you ready to go with this discussion? 
We want to grab a handheld, worst case. Roland Martin is here. Give Roland, Roland Martin. Roland Martin. <laughs> You want to grab this handheld? You want me to do the handheld? Yeah. You want me to, you want me to have the handheld? Oh, yeah, there you go. Can you hear me now? So the first thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm so honored to be here and so pleased to be here. And uh, we are all here in service of you. Um, the beautiful aspect of, of being friends with all these guys for so long. Is I'm hoping that we can have a warm conversation that ends up being profound and people learn something. And it's not just about us here talking and talking. It's really about you gaining some information and some knowledge. So that's my intention, and I hope that we can bring that forth today. Um, the first question is, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw it to Andre, who's really kind of like Uncle Dre to all of us. He kind of raised so many of us in the business. Um, without Dre, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now. But he's from the Bronx, and he's from the birthplace of hip hop. So Andre, I wanna ask you, why was there a need for hip hop and its culture? Um, I think uh, in the Bronx at the time, we were getting disillusioned. And just New York City in general, we were getting disillusioned with R&B. R&B kind of went funk, kind of went jerry curl, kind of wasn't what we were doing. So they, they didn't have a big like um, after school music program. So all of a sudden kids started playing with their mother's records and stereo and started scratching the records. Next thing you knew, you had hip hop coming. I remember the first time I experienced it was at my junior high school, 123. I was 14 years old. I went to a school dance, first one I ever went to. So I'm, I'm there, I'm partying, I'm dancing with this really cute girl all night long. <laughs> so at the end of the night, I asked her for her number. She said, I can't give you my number because I'm here with my boyfriend. I'm thinking to myself, I danced with her all night. Who's her boyfriend? <laughs> she pointed at this dude who was like five foot five. His name was Busy B. Starsky. And he was the MC of that day. And he tore the building down. And right then and there, I knew if this five foot five dude did this girl, I need to start rapping. <laughs> so I think the need was if you couldn't play basketball, you wasn't necessarily a mathematical genius, and you were looking for some way to stand out, hip hop became the way for you. And how, and how has the hip-hop lifestyle and form culture and changed the landscape in today's music, fashion, spirits, and just about every other business? Well, you have a lot of different uh, points of view in hip-hop over different decades. Uh, when I was coming up in the 70s, and you had Grandmaster Flash and Africa Bad Father break out the Funky Four, the group I was in was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We had like aspirational rap, but basically we, we was all inner city kids, we really didn't have a lot of wealth, so we were talking about the things we wanted to do. We didn't know that by talking about those things you wanted to do was like praying or chanting up into the universe and it would come true. So we were just trying to talk about a lifestyle that we wanted to ascertain to. And it, it actually happened. Now, different regions of the country, they talked about what it was going on in it was like, uh, she mentioned NWA, and NWA was seeing police brutality. So that's what they talked about. 
every part of the country talked about things that were going on at the embassy. So I think that uh, hip hop became uh, a teenage network of information around the form, around the country that everybody could start to understand what was going on. In uh, <clears throat> the hip hop video, right? okay. and we, we talked about, you know, Andre ran Uptown Records, which is the precursor to Bad Boy Entertainment. They, their videos, Uptown's videos were one thing, obviously Bad Boy's videos turned into Puff driving backwards in the bends with a cigarette driving off into the sunset. How did this hip hop video speak to the world about the, the urban culture? Well, I think um, hip hop videos became uh, advertising for black lifestyle for us and by us. Different than when you were trying to do a television show in the 70s when you didn't have a bunch of executive producers like Shonda Rhimes who were writing the shows, including us. So the only pure voice you saw that was authentically black was coming out the record companies and the boutique labels. So we would, we would uh, dress the artists a certain way. Uh, we would set the scenarios up in a way that you wouldn't see that on television. BET became our advertising for black lifestyle. And I think that uh, we took advantage of that. And especially my company, Uptown Records, we had kind of like a dressed up and a dressed down. And our first artist was Heavy D. And Heavy D, we used to keep him clean. Uh, he used to dance, he had choreography. He, he had a happy disposition. He knew how to treat women. And these were the kinds of things that the label wanted to say. So we would look for artists who did that. And I think um, through that, it changed the lifestyle. It changed the fashion. It really pushed our attitude of urban cool through, uh, which swag came from. Um, and it showed you all the things you wanted to know. Like if you had the money, what kind of car would you get? Uh, if you was successful, what kind of girl would you date? It, showed, it gave you a blueprint of if we had the success, what would it look like and what would we do and who would we hang out and where would we go? And so the aspirational lifestyle that you saw in the videos created a void. Like there were no, there were no uh, companies to service that. And it, it gave, uh, it's probably routes to all these different new companies. And I think one of the first companies to be effective like that, when Russell Simmons started Fat Farm, he knew that in the video, they were seeing these clothes and they couldn't kill them. So he started Fat Farm, and shortly after that, Buff came with a more glamorous version, Sean Chop. Uh, thank you for that. Get, getting beyond the hype of, of what hip hop is and, and all this conversation, Derek, can you speak to the magnitude of, of hip hop's impact on industries? Great. Um, check. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, first, I have to start out. Maxine yeah. didn't give herself full credit for what she's even doing today right. for our space. And very, very specifically, she mentioned this Comcast deal that I was credited for being one of the negotiators. In, but it was her efforts in the Congress that paved the way for Revolt TV to be a challenge. So beyond her fight for hip hop and free speech, she has been a partner along the way. And we'll talk later about how we will continue to need that. because There's so many barriers that we have to break. Uh, but to your specific question, um, one little known fact uh, that doesn't show up in my bio a lot is that I'm from the Bronx as well. <laughs> and I was trying to sneak into the Starsky parties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the of these Starsky parties when uh, Andre's a couple years older than me. Uh, but uh, to see uh, that lifestyle, I'm 12 years old, we, you know, we save up money to have two turntables and a mic. And you know, we just thought it was a thing you did in the neighborhood to be you know, popular in the neighborhood. So whoever had the two turntables and the mic, that's who you know, everybody was going to come over to their house. So you know, that was our goal. And we had the line out the door. Can I get five minutes on the wheels? Uh, so, but to see that grow into sitting at a table with real power was really incredible. One of the things I love about working for Sean Combs is that I never walked in a room where I didn't feel like we were the most powerful mm -hmm. entity in the room. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes these rooms were, we would have about three people on our side, and the other side would have 15 to 20 people. <laughs> you know, I'm looking around like, we look outnumbered, but the power all 
rested enough. So just thinking about the magnitude of the impact of hip hop on business, mm -hmm. I would go out there to say, I don't know if anything has had an impact on business mm -hmm. uh, the way hip hop ha has, other than maybe the internet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So why do I say that? So you look at the music business. So in 1997, I joined uh, Bad Boy in 1998. 1997, Sean Combs, Bad Boy Records, had the number one record on the charts for half of the year, 26 or 27 weeks out of 52 weeks, they had the number one record on the charts. This is a boutique label created in somebody's garage. Mm -hmm. So how do you impact a business like that so quickly? And it was all because he identified something and delivered something that wasn't being delivered in a, in a way that uh, no one else could do it, right? So, so, that was, so that's, that, that's example number one. Example number two, Sean John Clothing literally went from Jeff sketching out some stuff and running around and mad because he's sitting in a cubicle. <laughs> to, small cubicle. <laughs> and the record company. Really, to, really to, small. Uh, <laughs> being the number three men's brand in Macy's. This is not number three oh. compared to Rocka Wear and this. It's number three compared to every other men's mm. brand in Macy's. So that type of impact, you just do not see those shifts in industry. Last example, uh, Ciroc. When we uh, entered the partnership with Diageo, it was, an, it was the number 68 premium vodka in the marketplace. It is now number two and closing in on being number one. Yeah. You don't see those shifts in an industry without something incredible going on, like the internet, like the identif identification of hip hop as more than just a music form, but really a, 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 a new psychographic and really a white space that nobody was, was really tapping into. And I think ultimately what Sean Combs did within the hip hop space is really add the aspiration to it. So he had added the aspiration to the clothes. He said, you know, I want to be in spirits, but I want to be in premium spirits. So aspirationally, we're going to celebrate with these spirits. And adding that aspiration, I think, is what took something that was already uh, going to be incredibly large as an opportunity and really uh, multiplying that opportunity even further. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, so just going into a little bit about the specific units inside of the Combs Empire, Jeff, if you could speak to the deals that had to be struck to build Sean and John and expose some of the obstacles that right. you had to get over. We, right. we talk about how successful it was, but I remember you know, in the early days when you were just peddling sweatsuits and <laughs> nobody wanted to give you a meeting. So right. how did, how did right. you get over that? It, First of all, I'm not from the Bronx. <laughs> I'm, born, I'm born and raised right here in Washington, D.C. So we, <laughs> see, I knew that was good. <laughs> I grew up on Go-Go, and I still enjoy Go-Go. <laughs> oh, okay, man. You're cheating. This side of the room, Go-Go, here. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was, it was interesting. When we started Sean John, and, and it was very, um, it was, you had Sean P. Diddy Combs, who was, you know, really making a stance for himself as a producer and a, and a record mogul. But it was, it was the fashion industry that we had to take on was very difficult because at that time you had these larger brands, the Ralph Formans of the world, the George Armani, the, the, the Versace, and they looked at it as, so how do you, this rapper guy all of a sudden want to do a clothing line, how disrespectful of him. He thinks because he's on videos and he's got the number one music in the world that he can do uh, clothing now. And one thing that we did is that we, I have this saying, we always took the steps before we took the elevator. And I made a, a, a strategy that I would make sure that Puff was at every fashion show uh, before we launched the brand. Because I wanted to, the industry to embrace him, which they did. So when we did our first fashion show, although every editor in the first, first row and the, first, in the second row was sitting there with a brick in their hand ready to throw, uh, we came out and blew the, blew the industry away. Um, and, and, you know, that first show was in 99. It was a very successful show, and it was praised by Anna Winter from Vogue and, and, and uh, New York uh, uh, Magazine, and it was very successful. But besides that, it was still the longevity of it. How do you maintain the longevity of it? And our strategy was always, we didn't chase the money, we chased the vision. Um, and and the, other, the other companies, it was 36 companies that was on the, retail floor when we started our brand. Out of 36 of them, there's only six that exist now. 
and our vision and our strategy stayed in place. We had a blueprint that was fantastic, and we wasn't looking for money. We were looking to build a true lifestyle brand. And today, next year, we celebrate our 20th anniversary, where we have 18 categories that we produce. Um, we're now looking at how do we make this brand a billion dollar brand, and that's what I'm looking at in the international market, rather be China, rather be Dubai, and rather be uh, Germany. So we're looking to really you know, expand the, 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 the brand. Um, the challenges was, of course, you, you know, it seems like you're another brand that won't exist, won't last. Um, and our vision was really to follow the blueprint of a Ralph Lauren. If you go into any store, you see these huge shops that Ralph Lauren had. And you look right next to Ralph Lauren is our huge shop. So sustainability was very important to us. And getting the relationships that we now have established with the major department stores was very important. It wasn't easy. It, it took time, and, it, and, and we had to stick with our vision. Although there was a lot of companies telling us what we should be doing, we didn't have to listen to them because we didn't, we didn't need the money to do that. We, we stayed focused on what, we, what our vision was, and we, 20 years from now, we still have that vision and mission in place. All right. Very good. So, Tia is not from the Bronx. Your, your, your come up in Queens, when all this was happening, your business decision where you could end up you know, as the president of one of the most influential companies in the world. Um, so I grew up in a neighborhood called East Elmhurst, Queens. It's right near LaGuardia Airport. And um, at the time, as a child, I don't think I really realized some of the things um, that were influencing me in my neighborhood. So a guy named Herbie Lovebug, who really is a precursor to Sean Combs, who had movies, businesses, about five blocks from me. I was maybe like nine, 10 years old. From my backyard, I was catty corn. I would see Kid and Play and Salt and Pepper rehearse and rehearse and rehearse their dances all the time over and over again. And at the time, it was just cool to brag to my cousins down south, like, what's, what's going on in your neighborhood? Because there's some rappers in the back of my, you know what I mean? But it was not really like, it was really much more um, impactful to me in the long run um, because I think it's no coincidence uh, that I ended up where I am today. And the thing that, that experience, going up in Queens where Kwame was doing block parties and Play owned the local barbershop, and I could see my neighbors on movies, I could see my neighbors flourishing, having an actual business, hiring people, hiring accountants, hiring lawyers, um, you know, hiring stylists, real commerce coming out of what was our cultural hobby, we represented the way we walk and the way we talk, things that we love and the way that we live, it led me at least to some sort of foundation of like this is, this doesn't have to be like a small thing. Like we can change the world with hip hop. Um, and like I said, at nine or 10 years old, I didn't realize it. And I worked at the Department of Defense, did a ton of other more corporate gigs before I ended back in 2005 working for Sean Combs. Um, but I don't think uh, it's a coincidence that it feels like home based on those beginnings. So your, your business, the, your, one of the first roles you had with, with, with Sean led you into the, the head of the Combs and Martin Spirits, where you guys went from 50,000 cases to 2 million cases. Like, how, did, how does that happen? <laughs> it's not an accident. <laughs> um, Derek Ferguson alluded to this. We were, when we started to do the deal with Diageo, um, Diageo, I'm sure everybody's familiar. They're number one in the world in the spirits industry, almost. Johnny Walker Tangeray, anybody has a bar at home, I assure you there's a Diageo product on it. So we stand in confidence and power, but the reality is it would be like Derek and me, sometimes Sean, in a meeting with these phenomenal attorneys, best class, so much money. These people have 50,000 employees, billions of dollars, right? And, um, but we had to be grounded and clear about our power, right? And this story about Ciroc, I think, is a microcosm for all of us in this community to realize you may be two people. You may be in a zip code where your lights don't work, right? But your power is internal. Mm -hmm. um, so we stayed very clear in every piece of our negotiation and our process. And we also understood the power of our community. And we also understood that no one had really done a great job having a respectful and consistent and sophisticated engagement with a consumer that likes to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Everybody here works hard. I see some people, they might like a vodka martini on Friday, responsibly, right? Right, <laughs> right now. Uh, right, <laughs> right now, right? That, that's not appropriate. Nice, he's gonna kick me off. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, the, um, 
The reality is, the reason why we were able to grow from 50,000 to 2 million cases, which is no small feat, um, consistently now since 2007, is we paid attention in an appropriate way to an audience that was being ignored. And when you nurture any relationship in the right way, whether it's your husband, wife, sister, brother, or an entire community, they're gonna love you back. Well, because the um, music business is a lifestyle cultural business, I needed people who understood the hip hop lifestyle. And before my generation, there really was like Luther Vandross and Cameo, so there wasn't anybody trained in, in recognizing um, the hip hop. So I had to take people who had enthusiasm, had things going on, uh, like party promoters. Like I hired a lot of party promoters who understood how to uh, take a generic spot and say, we're gonna have a black and white party and everybody shows up in black and white. Because I had themes in my head. I just needed people who knew how to go out and, and um, speak about these themes and understand these themes. So I would meet different executives doing different things because during that time in the early 90s, we had magazines like Vibe and Source or you had marketing people and writers over there. We had Spike Lee, who had a film company, so you had production people over there. Then you had a lot of new uh, video production companies so who were doing our videos. So I would go to meet the people who felt the most passionate about the point of view, and I would hire them. Because I didn't want anybody coming to my company who was taught like the Sony way or taught the Warner Brothers way, because none of them were in the particular niche that I was in. So I figured, I was the best teacher. I was a rapper since I was 14. So by the time I had my business with my first album, I was 26 years old. So I was 12 years deep. I had all the relationships with Mr. Magic and mm -hmm. DJ Marley Mall and all the, that kind of stuff and all the producers, Teddy Riley and so forth. So I needed to bring people in who I could pass those relationships on, who understood what the culture was, but more importantly, understood how to get us to the goal. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so Derek. Holmes partnered with a lot of companies while building this empire you guys built. How did you go about the process of selecting partnership? I think that's one of the, the key things that we all want to understand. Sometimes when you're starting a business, you don't have to do it all by yourself. Yeah. So how, how did you select those partners and what was the process? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Sean had a very simple approach, which is we go to the best. So <clears throat> who are the biggest and the best, and they should, wanna, they should understand this value and want to do it. Now, everybody didn't always want to do it. <laughs> and I remember even with Sean John, like you would just leave meetings shaking your head, like literally, like, can I pull you aside? Like, you're about to walk away from something like, incredible, you know? But again, coming into the, this conversation with the level of confidence uh, and, the, and the level of knowledge of what you have, what you're bringing to the table, is very important in these meetings. And is, um, you know, I was the, you know, the Harvard MBA in the bunch, right? So I would come into the room with the analytics. Okay, you know, if we get the deal between this and that, that's a great deal. But what Sean Combs is great at is really knowing the value. Not that he didn't pay attention to analytics, he'd look at it, but then he'd say, no, they want this bad. They want this. <laughs> more than this $25 million. They want this $40 million worth. And that's just my gut and my feel. So you go into the meeting knowing your value. And I would literally in some meetings, I just want to kick them under the table. Like, that's a good number, come on, let's go. And he's like, and the second thing he had, this is the second very important thing, he knew what he had. So he was always ready to walk away. D and I, we would be in rooms like, come on, what are you doing? Like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Like, I'm not sacrificing one penny of the value I know they want to give me. And you know, despite all the great analytics I got proven wrong over and over again, 
because they always did it at his number. The, the so, worst thing is when you the worst is when you walk to his office when you get the deal, and he goes, "I told you, you just need to dream bigger." <laughs> <laughs> and his favorite line, "You, you y'all need to bring me in earlier. <laughs> y'all need some time." <laughs> so I think so, but partnerships are really are really critical because. You know, Andre's right. We were doing something that had never been done before and is very different, but then we had to work with the Diageos of the world, the Estee Lauders of the world, and we had to figure out how to work within this corporate enterprise. And I, honestly, in most cases, they had to be turned upside down. I remember the first fragrance plan that Estee Lauder came in the room with, I think Sean literally ripped it up. It was like, no, we're not doing any of this. This is not how you reach, this is not how you reach wow. my market. And you have to be bold enough and confident enough to be in a room with experts that have made billions of dollars, literally, and say, you got it wrong, <laughs> and if you don't want to do it my way, I'll go somewhere else. Right. But, but it's also, I'm sorry, but it's also, and some, keep in mind some of these meetings, those executives left those meetings going, he did it a different way. And they went to their team and said, we need to do it the Sean Combs way. Uh -huh. We need to think about what they're doing over there, bad boy, what they're doing at Sean John. So it changed, the, when you talk about the impact on the culture, it changed the, their company's thought process also, which was, mm -hmm. so we didn't get enough value for that in 20 years, though. But. <laughs> and, and that's something we talked about a little earlier, Derek. We were talking about, you know, how much money hip-hop has created in value in the early days of hip-hop, how much money has really created, but, you know, we didn't keep that money. You know, like, the, the question becomes, you know, going forward, how can we better control our wealth? Right. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, we can be really excited about what, what value uh, uh, that has been created with hip hop and how much of that we've uh, retained, but honestly, I'm very disappointed. I would say if you look at the whole value chain, in some cases, we were getting 10% of the value because the distributor was getting this or the manufacturer was getting this. So we were so excited to have a big opportunity that we were accepting 10%, 20% of the value chain, and somebody else got the 80%. Mm -hmm. So I say there's two things going forward that we really have to think about. One is this dream team concept <clears throat> that LeBron James and, and all these basketball players thought about is really the right concept, right? So one of the ways we lost value, I believe, in hip hop is we allowed ourselves to be fragmented, right? So as opposed to say, okay, I'm gonna grab uh, Russell Simmons, I'm gonna grab Jay-Z, and we are hip-hop brain trust, and you don't, you don't get in this brain trust without the right number. Nobody gets in. But when you can peel it off and say, well, I'm gonna sign this one over here, sign that one over there, you're actually reducing the value. So I think going forward, we really have to think about more collaboration and, and, and really coming together to consolidate versus allowing ourselves being fragmented. The second thing is really what um, uh, Con Congresswoman Maxine Waters can help us with, which is that we got a legacy of systems of distribution that have just kept us out. And we need to break those barriers down. So we can consolidate all of the knowledge and creativity and business value and then be able to distribute it on our own terms. The value goes from that 10% to 100%, hopefully. Just so y'all know, I hired him when I was working at Bad Boy. <laughs> I think that there's a, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of great hires that, that Puffy was able to make. Um, you know, he's also hired a lot of women. And I think I want to ask Tia today, you know, that, you know, how, how, how was that experience being a woman in hip hop culture? And how did you make your way to the top of the food chain? Well, first I would say, um, you know, I, I mentioned I also work in the Department of Defense. So, like, let's be clear, there's a ton of misogyny happening over there as well, right? So you think about, I think it's funny, coming from DOD and working with Naval Air and then working in hip hop, there's a lot in common, just in all, you know, truthfully. Um, you know, both good and bad. Um, I think one of the things that's been important to me, and this is just me personally, has been coming after a period in the 80s and 90s where the women who were successful in the music industry, specifically in hip hop, really sacrificed everything. Mm -hmm. Their femininity, 
their lives. They were single. They didn't have children. They would, you know, wear shoulder pads, and they really were turning. They were like, I'm gonna have to be a man to survive in this world um, <laughs> if I want to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've been so excited to see in this new, in this time, I, again, I, I guess what is this? It's been 20 years. Um, is like you be your whole self. You know, I'm so happy and grateful to God to be happily married with a beautiful four-year-old with a network of just the baddest women you've ever seen are all around the world that are like phenomenally women all day long mm -hmm. and leaning into that power and not running away from it because mm -hmm. um, another woman who works with us, Erica Pittman, says this a lot. Like when you walk into a room, and almost every room I walk into very often, and I'm, I'm 41, I'll be 42 on Tuesday, but I'm still the youngest, only minority, only woman, almost all the time. When you walk in there with your red lipstick and you're fully a woman, you're going to get attention for being there. But how do you use that platform? So when you use it for your intelligence and your negotiation skills and you move it forward and you progress other women mm -hmm. by taking that platform, honestly, I think you get a little bit of an unfair advantage. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the way I use it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, yes. Give the panel a big round of applause. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, let me do this. We have some microphones, I think. Uh, do we have some microphones set up somewhere? Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Janice, Janice Bryant Harrod uh, to be one of the first to take the microphone. I'm going to ask my grandson, Mikhail Moore, to take the microphone, uh, because I, I know that you have uh, some interest and some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just pretend. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for such an illuminating uh, discussion. Um, in the whole of the questions that you were asked, the theme was about being your unique self, and you spoke so beautifully on behalf of women about allowing us ourselves to bring our whole selves to work. The question that I have for you is, how do you then pass that strength on throughout your full, not just supply chain, and you, you're, you're on the mark about making sure we look about infrastructure and legacy practices. How do you pass that value on through to the folks who are now the next generation. So I work with a lot of people and I put millions of people to work across Janice, the globe. Janice, please tell them what you do. Oh. Please tell them what okay. you do. Okay, my name is Janice bryant Halroyd. I'm the founder and CEO of a multi-billion dollar organization, Act One Group. We are at heart workforce solutions that include staffing and our own design technologies because other companies would not allow us to use theirs. And we too competed in an inequitable marketplace where we had to define how to grow our business. So technology became my geography. Today I'm in 22 countries across the globe, but technology spearheaded that. And and so many of your customers are my customers because they're my clients as employees. My question is, again, how do you take the thematic learnings that you have centralized through this discussion and pass that to generation next? So first, I think um, the most important thing is honestly, and I say this very seriously, is like we actually have to, we have to exchange phone numbers after this, right? So we talk about, no, I mean in real life though, like you have to, not for fake, not LA talk, we have to actually talk about, okay, let me know how I can be in business with you in real life. How are we actually putting real power, real might together, right? So there's that. Um, in terms of next generation, I think one of the most critical things is starting so much earlier than we start. Um, this country spends a disproportionate amount of money on like college education, right? But there's a reality that you actually have to start dealing with pregnant women and early families, right, in the way you develop our children. Um, just, just as simple as, if you ask me, if you really want to talk about legacy, if we don't get the United States um, like family leave right, right, right now U.S., Papua New Guinea, and I forget the third country, there's only three countries that have similar uh, family leaves. Mm -hmm. Every other, every other like, industrialized nation has um, the appropriate level of care. So when you talk about like, building a legacy, it starts with 
you have to make sure that family and community is actually important. One of the biggest problems to me and that we're suffering from in our communities is this complete dissipation of actually knowing your neighbor, mm -hmm. right? Actually knowing. This is, so I could talk about like education and there's a ton of programs that we do in terms of donations and building and ensuring that children are receiving um, entrepreneurship, which is another thing that I feel like is a tool to eradicate poverty, which we talk about. But the real small pieces of it are building the foundation of confidence where people actually know one another, uh, where you have real communities with real centers where people actually care. I remember a time when if you were anywhere, if I was any, if I was any part of the country or an airport and I saw another black person, you gave a nod. Yeah. Right? Do they remember? Yeah. That has gone, you know what I mean? Like that was just a common thing. That has right. gone away. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and can you good. tie can you tie into that? Can you collect into that? Yes. You you understand the power of social content? Yes. Right social connectivity and messaging and community yes. utilizing this platform that we do have this free space in. Can you tie that in? I will. Let me tell you, um, this is by example. So I'm on the board of an organization called Thread, Thread in Baltimore, which speaks to the fact that I grew up on Bugs Bunny. You pull the thread, the whole thing falls apart, right? That's the way our communities are. Um, in this particular organization, we target kids who are less than 5% likely to graduate from high school. We're very purposeful around, like, no, we want the kids who have, uh, for example, one had two parents who were deaf and on drugs and on crack and they were prostituting her for drug money. She would not leave because she did not want her young sister to be prostituted, right? These are the kids that we take and essentially we build a community around them. We assign five to 10 adults for, their, for 10 years and we commit to them the way the gangs do. Mm -hmm. The model is actually based on the uh, Baltimore Guerrilla Family Gang, right? Mm -hmm. And it's extremely successful. We take these kids to less than 5% to over 90% graduation rate. The reality is though, and the reason why I'm not, I'm not trying to oversimplify this, all we are doing is creating community. Picking, taking them to school, being on standby, picking them up. And that small foundation, it may seem like an overly simplistic answer, but it really is the major problem for all of us, that you don't know your neighbor. Thank you. I, I like to, I like to talk further about I think, I think um, in terms of uh, building executives a certain kind of way, I think it starts at the top. I think you have to have a certain amount of principles, and I think you have to sit there and teach them how to think by asking them why are they saying what they're saying and see if it's logical and mm -hmm. teach them at the very beginning to be logical. I've always believed that in the music business, because it's pop culture, everybody has a right to their opinion. But I want to hear why you think your opinion is right. And I want to point that out to the other people in the room, that this person knows how to think about this problem. So I think once you teach people how to, how to think, it's like teaching someone how to fish. As opposed to giving them the fish, you teach them how to fish, and they can feed their family. And that's how I think you create legacy by passing on those principles and teaching people how to think. Everything is political. You need to understand that underneath every opportunity and every decision you make, and you have to understand the local level of political power. And I'm hearing you guys speaking about the local level of your power. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mikhail Moore. Hello. I'm Mikhail. <laughs> uh, the Congresswoman uh, surprised me and asked me to come up here. But I actually owe a lot to a lot of people on this stage because my previous life was as chief of staff for Congresswoman Waters. I got out the political game and I now manage Wonderland Management, <laughs> which manages Janelle Monet and Jadena and many other people. What, what most people don't know is that Janelle was actually signed to Bad Boy first before she went to Atlantic. And Puff, talking about the power of knowing your value, Janelle had gone to every record label before she met Puff. Um, Puff found her on MySpace, called her, and the first thing she did was hang up the phone because she didn't think it was really Puff. <laughs> and then when he called back, uh, Big Boy from Outcast was on the phone with him, so she believed it. And Janelle knew her power as well, because what she said was, if you really want to sign me, you'll come down here tomorrow because I have a show in Atlanta, at the Underground in Atlanta. Puff said, I have the finale to making the band tomorrow, I can't do that. And she said, 
if you really want to sign me, you'll come down tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> to see me at the underground. And Puff came. And he came, he saw her the next day, they had a conversation, and he took her back into those same labels, and she was signed with the same tuxedo, the same pompadour, mm. the same dance moves, mm. but the power of that, that collaboration was what pushed it through. Um, so, so the question I wanted to ask, because all of you guys spoke about the businesses that you've done, but I think one thing that's really important in the moment that we're in is about ownership, right? Um, ownership of your IP, uh, ownership uh, equity in the companies that you're, that you're promoting, and Ciroc is a great example, Revolt, Sean John. Can you guys talk a little bit about the difference between being a brand ambassador and selling somebody else's brand and having equity and ownership with the, with the brands that you're building? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, great question. Um, and reality is that uh, as we talk about what you know, value creation, um, you know, the short term and long term. Long term value cr creation is really all in equity, right? So when you hear, when you look at this Forbes list and you say this one is worth 50 billion and Bill Gates is worth that, generally that's all because of their ownership in these companies, right? The, the equity in these companies. So I think um, if I'm on one side of the deal and I know I have something worth this and I can write you a check for 5% of this and you're gonna, you're gonna think that's a big number, I, get, I got to keep the rest of that value, and you, you get to walk away with the 5%, right? So the key is to maximize your value, and you know, the trick is that it requires patience, right? And one thing about, uh, the, you know, one thing about what Sean Combs created, he's always patient. Like even this 20th anniversary of Sean John, 20th anniversary of Bad Boy, he's like, that's not a long time. <laughs> you know, like, I want to celebrate 50. You know, like, so it takes patience. And to build equity value takes patience. It may not be overnight. To build equity value may mean you have to come out of your own pocket, right? So investing up front that seed capital versus getting it from someone else, you could have to give up half your company up front for seed capital if you don't want to bring money out of your own pocket. So uh, equity value is really, you know, how you create wealth. Um, there's a whole bunch of also tax benefits, right? So when you hear uh, someone like uh, Mitt Romney, when he ran for president, they were like, his tax rate is like 16% or something. It's because he's getting capital gains income versus ordinary income, which means you keep more of it, right? So there are a whole bunch of reasons why we really don't build anything if we don't build that. Okay, let's move right on uh, with the questions. Yes. Uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, give honors to you and to our hip hop association and pop culture. Uh, Congresswoman, I have, and to, to, to culture, I have some good news for us, right? I'm a, a retired scientist from NASA, got a space flight center, and I did analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was the only one looking like me in my branch over a picture for some of our PhD scientists and engineers. And there were some women there too, and, the, and these women were, were like, like you, Congresswoman Con Waters, and, and you, you saw you saw the movie, The Hidden Figures. But I have a, uh, some good news for you, but I have a warning for our Democrat leadership. The thing is, I did analysis on this uh, evil system called the the three fifths compromise of the clause of the Constitution of 1787, which is called the Electoral College. And as you know, there are 500 and 38 electoral fellows in several swing states, you know what the swing states are. They, they could take the election away from our popular votes, but you know that it happened to Al Gore and it also happened to Hillary Rodham Clinton. She will win almost three million vote, more votes than this demagogue that's in, in the White House now. The thing here is, it's going to happen again if we don't pay attention. But the good news here is, I believe that Congresswoman was, I wrote a letter to you, I have a copy of that letter. And I wanted to share with you my research. The hip hop, yeah, yes, the hip hop, the hip hop culture could could help win this, turn this electoral college around, and this electoral system, even system around, and and do this. And and do, if we don't vote in this swing state, it'll happen again. The hip hop culture can go and swing this thing around. And I want to get your reflection thank on you that. Thank you very much. And we have to warn our people about this. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, let, let me just um, uh, take, take a moment uh, to say that, um, you know, today we're focused on um, the contributions of hip hop to this economy. And uh, we wanted to do that because we think that it has had a tremendous impact and we believe that it inspires a lot of our young people uh, to use and develop their creativity and to create these new niches and all of that. And so I don't want to burden them about the electoral college. You let me impeach this president and we'll take care of that. <laughs> Please. We're, 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 we're there to help. All right then, that's what I want to hear. We're there to help. This next young lady, you guys need to know, this is Kendra Smith. And I consider her the poster child for what's wrong with mandatory minimum sentencing mm. in the criminal justice system. Mm. And so every year she comes uh, to the Congressional Black Caucus and she's involved in a workshop that talks about uh, the over six years that she's been in prison and how she got there based on these conspiracy laws and so I'm glad she stayed. Please give us your question. Thank you, Congresswoman yes. Waters. I thank you for allowing the opportunity for the, this discussion. Um, I'm an author, public speaker. I was sentenced to 24 and a half years as a first time nonviolent drug offender and sentenced and served six and a half years. There was a tremendous amount of support along with Congresswoman Waters that advocated for my, my release. The black community advocated for my release. You all understand to much is given, much is required. And so since my release, I've been involved in trying to change policy and bring people home because I want to help bring those that I left behind home. While I was incarcerated, I was incarcerated with Michelle West. Andre Harrell, I want to personally thank you for hiring Mikhail West, who's a stylist that works for Revolt. Um, but while I was incarcerated, I respect all of you all, actually, um, Puffy wrote me a letter saying that he was gonna do whatever to do, he could do to help bring me home. Sister Soldier came inside the prison with Jada Pinkett to talk to the women and give us hope and inspiration. We look up to you. Um, there are several people incarcerated that live for the TV room, live for their headphones to listen to the radio. But I left hundreds of people behind who have life sentences two women like Michelle West who have already served 25 years and have a life sentence. And now that we're in this new administration, I'm, I'm grateful for all that what's been done in the past. And you spoke, um, Mr. Ferguson, about having a hip hop brand trust and how we need to consolidate. And I understand making money and how important that is and having a vision. But how is it that you all hold these influential positions and how is it that you pick what political platforms to be involved in and how as um, moguls can you come together to decide what issues that you can help push to help change because um, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, he's not thinking about us. He's not thinking about continuing the Obama mm -hmm. legacy and letting some people go home on commutations that deserve a second chance. So how do you decide how political you can be without losing investors? Thank you. Who commuted your sentence? President Clinton. And, but he was also responsible for the big prison boom, too. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Right. okay. One, of the, one of the ways that uh, we can be helpful is by shining a light on what's going on. And we could do that at Revolt. At Revolt, Derek has led uh, Revolt Justice, where we try to deal with uh, police and people getting shot and people being incarcerated unjustly so that we can start to build up an awareness across young adult America and try to find some of the things we can do to help these people get out and change some of these laws. Yes, and we did a documentary on Michelle West. I did see the clip. On Revolt. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, the issue, there are a lot of them, but this is at the core of the issue of today. Right, so we talk about this and think about this quite a bit because we realize how impactful it is. If for nothing else, we have a generation of people that are going to be lost to lack of education, imprisonment, I mean, beyond even what you're saying, or just the whole model of debtor's prisons 
that are plaguing places like Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland. So shining a light is very significant for us. And I think merging, you know, creativity, something that Jeff has worked on that he can talk about, uh, you know, creativity and, you know, um, uh, marketing uh, to, uh, to these problems. So one of the things we were involved in at, uh, at Bad Boy was the Vote or Die campaign in 2004, which really got the vote out. But these are like little pimples on a huge problem. So we need just a, a, a significant collective effort that even as we lead it, we also need mm -hmm. literally millions of people to join because it's, it, the, the magnitude is that, is that big to really change it. Well, Congresswoman Waters, you talked about niches. So if there's any way I can be of a help and connect with you guys in doing that, please let me know. I would love, I would love to talk to you about that. Thank you. Doing a fair amount of work with uh, Mr. Kyra Belafonte, yeah. whose whole life is really about art and activism. And our, our charge right now, we have spent about three and a half hours with Mr. Belafonte yesterday, was speaking about how we can use artists and their platforms to speak to issues. And there's, there's really no limit to how far you can go. You have to use your platform Thank you, Kim. Is the documentary in the making? For me? Yeah. Um, I've been in communications with BET. I have a good lawyer, entertainment lawyer, Nina Shaw. It's been years. You I've worked with John Singleton. Huh? <laughs> You've got a great entertainment lawyer. Okay. <laughs> so I need to get okay. back there to talk to them. All right. Okay. Very good. Now we're going to move it a little bit more quickly. I wanted uh, Kim to have this platform uh, because of her experiences and all of the contributions that she's making. So I want you to ask your question quickly. We're gonna take care of the whole line. Go right ahead. Good morning. My question is in terms of the collaboration piece. And speak up and speak directly into the mic. The collaboration. Um, you guys talk about collaboration, coming together, using the resources and becoming more powerful. But how do we translate that information to the young people? Um, a lot of times there's a crabs in the barrel mentality. I got mine, you gotta get yours. But how can we change the mindset of self into, you can still be self, but you need to join and have partners and make it better for everyone else while you're doing what you do. Thank you. Well, yesterday I was speaking at Morehouse Spellman, and a lot of young people were coming to the mic saying, that they wanted to be in the music business. The way I got in the music business, I took my college friends who were good in accounting, I took my college friends who promoted parties, I took my college friends who were in law school, and I put together a team of like-minded people. And, and, and in the record business, you can't do anything on your own or in, or in any of these businesses. It's about the team. And you have to surround yourself with like-minded people. And I think people in successful positions have to preach that to young people so they understand it's not just about you, we are looking past you, and we are looking who's behind you as well. And start to say things like that. Okay, let's keep moving. First of all, I love that answer. Uh, my name is Principal Hucho, I'm handling from the University of Connecticut. Uh, me and 50 other black men filed on a bus and drove seven hours to get here. Can my scholars brothers please stand up? Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. We are a part of a community on campus called the Scholastic House of Leaders who are African-American researchers and scientists led by Dr. Eric Hines. Um, these, these men here have the most potential I've ever seen in any students that I've ever met. They inspire me every day. Um, we inspire each other, we study together, we party together, but we definitely do study together. <laughs> um, most times we'll be the only two black males inside of our coding classes, inside of our accounting classes, and at times when we usually do feel alone, we can look to the left and see one of our brothers. I believe each one of you had a defining moment where you realized your potential. I would like to know what that moment was, and secondly, I would like to know how we can find that potential and understand that potential within ourselves. Thank you. Good question. Um, I think that, um, I don't know there was one seminal moment, but what I will say is, and I, I grew up, my father always said, like, do what you love and the money will follow. Sean Combs always talks about whether you believe it or not, he does not do any of this for the money. Um, and when you look at the time of your life, most people live on average in America up to 80 years old now. 
you're gonna spend probably 35 to 50 years at work. I need a resource for So if you're so blessed to find something that feels like like you love what you do, that's the moment. For me, for me uh, God, you go, you go, no. <laughs> for me, it was growing up in Washington, D.C. and I made a paradise shop in the neighborhood. And it was when I realized that I'm, that, that I'm doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing, I made it at that level, right? But it's that passion. My mom always told me, if, you, if you're passionate about what you do, whatever it is, do the best that you, that you can do and be passionate about it. And like Dia said earlier, I don't, I don't do it for money. I do it because I enjoy what I do. The money's going to come. And, I, and, and one of the things that we, that we tend to stop doing, and I do it to this day, and everybody's heard this story from Puff, is I continue to dream. Even at my age, I dream. Because I'm never satisfied. I continue, I continue. I'm going to tell you a story. When I first got in the record business, um, there was a guy who was the biggest guy in the record business. His name was Joe Busby. He was the head of MCA Records. Have you seen the new edition movie? Tank played Gerald Busby. So, Gerald Busby uh, wanted me to take a position at his company as an A&R. So he flew me and my attorney out to Los Angeles to meet with him and his boss, Irving Azoff. Flew us first class. And I took my attorney, who was the first attorney I met, who was like 80 years old, his name was Marty Bichette. Had an office on Fifth Avenue. So when we get to the meeting, um, Irving starts to talk, well, this is the young man you've been talking about so far, so on, he said, yeah. Then Marty took over and said, but we're not interested in a job, we're interested in a production deal, a million dollar production deal. Now at the time, Gerald Busby probably was making 175,000. The white guy who was his boss probably was making $800,000. I was sitting there, I probably made $10,000 that year. <laughs> so, so when Marty Michette said that, I know it embarrassed Gerald Busby, the black executive. Because <laughs> he definitely wasn't thinking I was gonna come from the Bronx asking for a million dollars. So um, the meeting kind of got off track and um, Marty Michel said, you should go back to the hotel and I'll work out the details. So the meeting was at four o'clock. So you know, you expect to hear a call around five, 5.30. So it's seven o'clock came, eight o'clock came. I'm sitting there bugging out now, like what happened? And I, I finally reached Marty Michel and um, he's in Malibu and he said, well, they're gonna talk to us more next week. I knew what that meant. That meant I was going back to my studio apartment in Left Rack City. So the turning point for me was never let, let anybody know. take your power in your decision making. Okay, um, let's move on so that we can get uh, everybody accommodated that's in line. Wonderful, well, great, great panel. Thank you guys for sharing your stories. Uh, my name is Tyler Brown. I'm a Washingtonian, an entrepreneur. I run a fitness company called Get Strong Fitness. We try to take young men from the hood, Ward 8, teach them entrepreneurship and bring them in and teach them health and wellness because we need it out here. But my question for the panel is, um, on the Define Ones documentary, Jimmy Iovine talked about pivoting and about creating like a divorce portfolio. Um, we get told a lot as young people coming up, you gotta do one thing, focus on that one thing, you know, and stick with that. So with Looking at Puppy's story and how he branched out into so many different businesses, different industries, but kept it all cohesive, and then he put together a team like you guys. Could you just speak to the power of the pivot and, yeah. and the value as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think uh, part of it is how you define what you're doing, right? So if you define, um, I'm doing music, right. then it'll feel like a pivot when you do clothing. Mm -hmm. But if you really define that I'm creating lifestyle, right, then everything that comes along with that lifestyle becomes not really a pivot, but just a natural order of things, like what to do next. So I did music, then I did clothing, then I did TV. Then I, so, you know, so I think it's how you define what you're doing. So health and wellness, right? What does that go along with? It goes with what you eat, goes with what you drink, goes with your routine, your scheduling. So what is the real definition of your business? And then how, what are the natural next steps you take by correctly defining what you're doing? Major right. shout out to my man Jeff Tweedy from DC. How you doing? Representing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Leroy Collier. I'm a sophomore at the University of Connecticut, along with the Scholar Brothers right here. And I personally want to know because you guys spoke a lot about power and importance of culture. And we also we often see our culture being adopted by other races on the public scale, whether it's in music, fashion, and they often get more notoriety than we do. So I personally just wanted to know how you guys feel about that. 
I'm Beverly Vaughn, I'm the founder of Black Girls Rock, and I... <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to be um, a part of hip-hop culture and be um, mentored and have a great friend in Andre Harrell. And so I learned early the importance of my value. But I also learned early the importance of our value and our culture, and it's like what Kanye said that, it, and what the other gentlemen just talked about our contributions to this world is our gold and it matters. So how do we as influencers mentor the next generation to understand the importance of continuing to preserve our greatness? For me, I usually look at young people and what they're doing and I try to add it to what I'm doing and I let them know that I'm getting this from them. I try to empower them by their thoughts, by their generation, by their style, by their way of going about problems. I say to them, this works, and why don't you try that? Why don't you put him in the same thing you're wearing? I think you have to, uh, you have to talk to them and let them know what's special about them and empower them and then give them opportunity to work that out. But also, Beverly, go back to the microphone so we can hear you and thank you for that wonderful Black Girls Rock. I love that. Thank you. Guys, because if you come for me, I'm coming for you. <laughs> That's our line. Um, I, I also mean not just individuals, but people who are the next generation in this culture. Like when, when you know, being under you and Puff and watching, you know, how you guys built this. You know, I, I kind of, I always tell people that I'm, I'm like, I see my brand like Puff. I see my brand like, like Jay-Z, right? And I understand the importance of what we have to say and how much meaning it has to our community. And now, in this industry, it seems like there are a lot of people who are controlling what our children are listening to and controlling um, the lack of integrity of our art. And our art has, has helped us survive from our, our time coming to this country. Our art has helped us. It has it's helped our soul. And I don't see that there is as much care about the messaging and the integrity um, and just the, the, the richness, the richness of what we bring to the table. Okay, so, let's, let's get some feedback. Yeah. Okay, so are you, are you talking about uh, Creative businesses being controlled by non-black people. By non-black by, people. By non-black people speaking to black people and black people who are kind of not caring about what's being done to us as a community, and we're in our wealth in it, and our peace in it, and our stake in it, especially things that we've created. So now that we've elevated ourselves to a, to another level of power. You're talking about the power of distribution and controlling the <coughs> message. And being and having more people who look like us in that position to make sure it gets the kind of care and detail and the, the right information put into the entertainment products. That's what you're talking about? Yes. Um, one in the record business, it's true. Um, since the demise of the boutique labels, it's all become corporate and it's all been run by accountants. And because of hip hop, being as old as it is, it's 40 years old now. So you have a whole generation of mainstream people who grew up hip hop. Uh, and they think because they grew up hip hop, that is the entirety of the black perspective, which is not. Um, I think that uh, what influences that to change 
is when they're not making money. Mm -hmm. when, when, because the product is watered down or compromised, it's not jumping off like it's a piece of culture. It's just a, a piece of entertainment that comes and kind of goes, and they don't build any real equity with that. I think something like that, we as a community of executives from different industries, we definitely have to speak up about that. But two, I think that the business model uh, will start to fall apart without us. Because when I came in the record business um, in the 70s, there were probably 20 black executives who controlled the black music marketing, who had the right to say, we're going to spend a million dollars on this, two million on that, and the message should be like this. Uh, but now, uh, since the companies have got swallowed up and all the majors have bought the boutiques, it's basically controlled by three white guys. So I think um, conversation like this, where people are, are starting to realize, is that what's going on? Right. It, it, it starts to affect them, and, and I think the bottom line will affect them. And I, we'll get back to that. We have to amplify the greatness of you know, 444 or Kendrick Lamar or Chance okay. Rapper, okay. or some of the biggest MCs that have had a real solid legacy type career. So amplify the great, and you know, the, the latest mobile rap might not be that. Okay. All right, thank you. We're going to move on before we do. I want you to know that my friend Ed Gordon is in the room. He's with Bounce TV. It's the first African American broadcast network, broadcast television, and digital. Please stand up and wave and say hello to everybody. And I, I know. take time, but I just want to say part of the reason I'm here, we've been with Maxine the last two weeks. We're doing a profile on her October 2nd. I just want everybody to know Auntie Maxine is far more than that. So let's make sure that we're behind her in everything she's doing. All right? right. That's right. Thank you so very much. There are a lot of business people in the room and we'll get a chance to maybe um, have you at least stand at some point. But you know, we talk a lot about capital, and uh, we have the president of uh, one of our largest black banks in the room, Kevin Cohe. Would you please stand? <laughs> and so, yes, sir, please go right ahead. Hello, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm Trey, known as John Harris III. I'm the founder of a government agency known as Authentic Reflection, where I do contracting with the Department of Defense as a chaplain and an artist, so my lane is a little different. Um, but a couple years ago, I got to go to the first Revolt Film Festival and got to work it. And there I got to meet like Spike Lee and uh, Michael B. Jordan, Michael Googler. And I had my book, but I wanted to make sure I finished like the voiceovers and the music and the soundtrack, because as an artist, I wanted that type of control, so I financed the whole thing. And so my question is, um, after seeing Creed and Fruitville Station, I always kept that in the back of my mind. So in making the film version of the audiobook album and documentary people have been asking about, I was wondering if there was a way we could set up that meeting um, with Ryan Coogler, because <laughs> I know, you know. <laughs> what we gotta do. Uh, uh, I would like one of my staff persons on that side of the room. I suspect we're gonna have a lot of requests. And so what I want you to do is take the name, uh, email address, telephone number, etc. of anybody who's asking, and then we're gonna give it all to them uh, when they leave, and uh, we'll let's see what happens. All right? Okay, uh, uh, police, are you gonna get us started? All right, thank you. Let's go right here. Yes, my name is Tammy Gracefield, and I'm from Oklahoma City. I'm the director of National Women in Agriculture Association, and we have 45 chapters throughout the United States. We've been invited by Chairman Mike Conaway Tuesday to come before the um, members of Congress to ask for an initiative to help save and educate youth through agriculture. We have a program called Hip Hop Producers, where our, that's for the panel that some way we could connect um, to keep children engaged as well as them getting paid while what they do and tie into hip hop producers because we have a lot of them that have 
this gnat to want to wrap, but at the same time, they're in a sustain sustainable career of agriculture to grow food in their communities and sell to make funds. Also, we've connected with the NBA players that they're coming on board, but most importantly, we wanted to invite you, um, Congresswoman, to be a part of that listening panel on Tuesday on the Hill um, with um, Chairman Mike Conaway at 1030. And of course, any connections we can get to have support. We have women coming in from all over the country today and tomorrow to be at this event. Okay, I don't know what the schedule is, but we'll take note. Okay. All right. I want to make sure I heard right. Did you say you're going to pay kids to learn about growing Yes, food? sir. That's what we do all over the, that's we take our funds from grant funds and we give them a job and pay them every week that's to keep right. them engaged. Oh, we're going to definitely get in contact with you. Yeah, we, that's what we do. <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's great. Please, please identify Ag. Uh, I beside her name so that you'll know what to do with it. Yes, sir. Hello, Congressman uh, Waters. You're yes. a rare gift to our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Aaron Lewis. I'm a publisher, ghostwriter, and an archivist. Um, the Honorable Snoop Dogg once said last year that <laughs> hip hop is going to end up becoming. Um, and, and he guesstimates in 10 to 20 years um, a completely white idiom and black people who have built the entire um, idea of hip hop are going to be swallowed up. And I wanted anyone to speak to, you know, from an archivist point of view, um, yeah. if Snoop is prophesying correctly, and secondly, what can be done to make sure that hip hop um, stays at least black from the point of view of who actually started it and, um, and did the groundwork to make the, the hip hop movement as great as it is? Well, I would say all, every, in America, you look at jazz or country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, or pop music, um, almost every large music phenomenon has roots in people of color, right? Mm -hmm. So what he's describing is not different than what happened with country music, right, in, in just in reality. Mm -hmm. um, there's not gonna be any individual person that will save hip hop. <laughs> right, I mean, but what, what's gonna matter most importantly is what we've been talking about is, is having actual ownership of the thing that matters. I don't think anybody can steal hip hop from us because it's more than music. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a, a drumbeat of our culture. Um, but, but to retain absolute ownership of it 20, three, 400 years from now, um, it's gonna come down to like, what is our political and economic stance and the way we treat and view hip hop and the way we treat and view our community. Frankly, I think it's larger than hip hop. Okay. Good morning, my name is Izuma. I'm a master's student at Georgetown. Really quickly, Ms. Waters. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, really quickly, Ms. Waters, I'm a King Drew High alumna. And seeing oh. what you've done in our community, everyone knows her as like Auntie Maxine, but she has revolutionized <laughs> South LA for my entire life. So wow. thank you so much for all you continue to do. So really welcome. quickly. Um, so. As I began my post-grad journey, I've noticed a lot of my peers go to these institutions, come out, and they're severely undervalued in their first, second positions out of school. Um, and I feel like, what advice can you give to black millennials who are trying to get into the business, but they face a lot of institutional, systemic barriers, and kind of achieving the same level of respect and clout as their white individuals? I mean, yeah. I, I would say, I, I, I think you, you're gonna be under, so let's just start off there, right? You will be undervalued in your first year out of school. And honestly, that's just the nature of, a, of most businesses. Like you're, be, you're probably undervalued as a freshman in college. It kind of is, be okay with that and step up. I'll tell you an example. Derek Ferguson mentioned earlier that the Estee Lauder meeting where Sean said, look, this, this fragrance proposal is not the way we do business here, right? I was Sean's executive assistant at the time. I was not in that meeting. But I was sitting at my desk doing my assistant work and just overheard the conversation. Now, I had a background in marketing. I hadn't been an assistant actually before taking this job for Sean. So I sat that night from 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. and wrote a marketing plan for the launch of the fragrance. It's not my job whatsoever. And honestly, I hadn't even been in the meeting, so it was a bit ad hoc and overhearing and ear hustling. Gave it to Mr. Combs in the morning and was like, look, I think this is closer to what you're looking for, having an understanding of culture and marketing. He said, it is absolutely what I'm looking for. We went through it, and we ended up taking a good portion of it back to Estee Lauder. So what I would say is the way we are going to face barriers as minorities, as women, right, um, in general, and you probably will, there's no surprise to anybody, you probably may have to work six, seven times harder than anyone else. That's really the only answer, right? That is the real answer. Um, and the way to, to, to potentially change that and, and get it a little more fair 
is going to be owning our own businesses, giving ourselves a little bit of an unfair advantage. So here's some small things that I recommend to everybody is I will literally just go on Amazon and five star like black women's books. I, I didn't even read it. Five stars, five stars. You know what I mean? Like that's my Good. little like give back. You know what I mean? That's the kind of stuff we have to do. Like a yep. little bit of like you in a, like, when you're in a meeting, there's another you know minority executive. You got to be like that's a, oh that idea is phenomenal. I said I second that idea. Like we have to support ourselves a little bit extra to play catch up, and now the playing field. Thank you. Much respect to everybody on the panel and in the room. It's an honor to be amongst so many giants. Uh, Mr. Tweedy, I, I live in the same projects right around Paradise that you live from, so I, I respect where you came from. Uh, Mr. Harrell, it was in the early 90s when you signed Red S as a go-go band. Wow. Uh, my father's the lead vocalist in that group back then. Wow. And you and Puffy worked for a while trying to get the right sound that, that now DC is finally getting to. So again, much uh, appreciation and respect for you and what you all have done. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, as a young entrepreneur myself, and a demographic that doesn't have much of an infrastructure in DC, how do we, without those, I heard you say earlier, you know, Puff just hires the best. Well, that's with a billion dollar company that you all have. How do you do that without having that money or the political connections uh, that are already established? I remember when Puffy was just a background dancer for Colossal Records, so back then he couldn't have done it. How do you do it without what you all have now? You find like-minded people. people. You find like-minded people, people who have similar interests to you, that have a different expertise than you, and y'all chase the one dream together. Like I said in the beginning, you can't do any of this stuff by yourself. You need a team. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say something uh, that is a little tougher, but every idea is not a good idea. So if you're evangelizing your idea, and nobody's buying into it, nobody wants to help you, it's time to go to the next idea. So that's just one thing to really know. But when you, when you evangelize that idea, people are like, I like that idea. You're going to get yes, some attorney some somewhere, some like, finance person somewhere, going to be like, I'm jumping on board with that. Someone's going to want to embrace you know, it. What I, found, what I found very quickly with that is that most people who do like that idea, they want uh, maximum equity or control, uh, ownership and control of what you're doing with your idea. Uh, if you don't have those oh political God. connections. Yeah. yeah, and I think that is, uh, so you know, you have to sometimes patience. If you're getting those reactions, but you're not getting the right deal, patience, keep grinding with it, you'll find the right person. But, I, but there is a time, just for everybody in the room, the time to get off of that idea, and get on to something else. I'm not saying that's your Thank case, you. I think but that's but important. Sometimes, but some, I think that people follow the vision. You know, like when I was a young executive at a major label, and Poppy offered me my, my first role with him, Almost everybody told me not to do it. You know, they were like, oh, you know, this that is crazy. He's, he's too excited. <laughs> but he, he had a vision that I believed in. So I was willing to take a little less money, yeah. a bigger chance, and bet on the guy with the vision. So it's be the guy with the vision and sell your vision appropriately. You have to be a marketing man. You have to be the one to make sure. them believe. Yeah, I want to add, because we, we did the same We did the same thing, and we never knew this. I think we even find things out about each other. So I also took a pay cut to work. I had never to work for Sean Collins because I believed in his vision, and it paid it in the long run. So you, you got to make sure you're evangelizing your word the right way um, so that you can get people who believe in you. But also, you understand that it, it, sometimes it's okay to do a deal with someone for a short term. Um, Damon John is a friend of mine at FUBU. They only own 39% of their company. Right? And after five years, they were all millionaires. So sometimes, if the vision is right, the partnership is right, it makes sense. Right? Because you can continue, like Derek said, for three years of getting nowhere versus being in the game and owning 39%. Good morning to the panel. I want to thank y'all for your time, passion, on knowledge, and sharing your experiences. I wanted to ask Andre Orell a few questions. I wanted to know, is bad boy hiring at the moment? <laughs> also, how do you get on the vault? And can I, and I know you're busy, but I had some music on my phone. I wish you could listen. Is that wrong? That's how it's done? Um, yeah. <laughs> But I'm sorry, if, I'm, if I may, we actually, I, I, I am hiring. So I would like to go ahead and put that out there. We, I'm hiring for, I'm personally hiring for an administrative assistant out of the New York office. 
We have two account director roles if you're a senior in marketing and branding at the Blue Flame Agency, which is another part of the Sean Combs Enterprises. So please get your information over here if you're interested in those And anyone, anyone here, the young designers <laughs> that want to have a portfolio and done work, I would love to meet with you also. Yes. We're always looking for young talent. I like that. Good morning. Good morning, okay, everyone. Okay, that's exciting. Go right ahead. Next question. Hi. To Mr. Uh, Harrell's point on uh, uh, basically collective economics, just we're all trying to do that, and I appreciate seeing you all and members of the hip-hop community just uh, putting out calls to invest in, in, in black business, black enterprises. Mr. Combs himself on his Instagram, he's all the time saying, if you come correct, I'm, you know, I'm interested. So my question is, I've tried to reach out to people at Combs Enterprises. Um, obviously, you're busy. It's hard to find information. But uh, how do we get those meetings with you and get these ideas in front of you? Because I'm an attorney, graduated from Howard. I have a client who has <laughs> um, I have a client who has an app that's being developed by one of the biggest developers in the country right now. But you know, funding is always an issue. So it's like, how do I want, we want this to be something that is for us, our community, you know, it's for everyone, but you know, it benefits us. So um, my question is, how do we get those meetings with you all? How do we, how do we so, put it, get it in front of so you? So we have a uh, little plug here, but it's true. We have a, a music conference, Revolt Music Conference. Mm -hmm. And literally this whole group walks around Mm -hmm. interacts with people, talks, conversations, side conversations. Mm -hmm. Last year, Jeff kind of uh, adopted a, a young woman, a designer, took her, took, took him, uh, um, took her out with him and mm -hmm. introduced her to the industry. So, you, you know, so that, that's a place that we've created that for people like yourself that have ideas to come interact, be involved, and that, that's one of the better ways, emails mm -hmm. and phone calls right. and things like that are really mm -hmm. tough because you don't mm -hmm. know who's who, but in person right. seeing you now, seeing you down in Miami, mm -hmm. October 15th, <laughs> <that. laughs> would be Just helpful. Like the, the, whole, the whole art of getting on, mm -hmm. right? The art of getting on is, is a job in and of itself. Yep. Mm -hmm. like when I was on the come up, I, I met Andre Burrell, and, and I used to just go where he would go. Like I would, I would just, I would literally wait for him, follow him. You know what I'm saying? Like I would, I would stalk him. I was just about that, and, I, and I've done that. I still I'm here today. <laughs> like I, I, I'm chasing Bob Green right now because he, he's running a, a billion dollar business. Like I'm gonna be where he's at. Like you have to find, you have to never stop your hustle. Right. Right. You okay. can't let uh, an email. Yeah. And if I told Puff that I emailed somebody for something, you're like, yeah, you popped your mind. What did you know? <laughs> sit in the lobby. Did you find where they live? Right. Like, you literally have to do everything to do yeah. it. The one traditional route is not going to be it. Right. Gotcha. And the thank balance you is for saying the floor. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for that information. My name is Ebony Robinson. If you ever see me out there, that's my name. Okay. <laughs> Leave your name over with uh, Penice. Also, yes. Thank you, Congresswoman Waters, for putting this together. I have the last question. Um, thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, my name is Mardell West. Uh, I'm the chairman of the 100 Black Men of Prince George's County. Uh, I'm also <laughs> chairman and mentor for, for the 100. I'm also a first college graduate and my family from Philadelphia. Uh, I grew up in Overbrook section of Philly, and I'm also a recording artist. I started my own independent label and production, and I, I did my first uh, major show in South by Southwest. So I got a lot of things that I'm working on. I'm working on being a chart financial analyst too. So I'm taking oh. CFA level one. Okay. And, and th these are all things that I aspire to do. I'm, I'm hustling, man. I'm, yeah, I'm no, trying to be an ultimate hustler. And I, I, just, I respect all of you because I know the work that goes into trying to be successful. And, and my question to you is, uh, you know, my, my goal and my mission is to reach out. And I know we all share a similar narrative coming from impoverished communities. You know, you. You have those who are you know, being murdered to senseless gun violence, but we want to empower those and inspire those people to see that just because the outside view that they, they see doesn't mean that's the all, the all seeing, the end all. We want to empower them, empower them and inspire them to do better. So my question to you is, uh, could we uh, work or coordinate a meeting to uh, set up with the 100 Black Men of America to kind of facilitate the hip hop narrative and build uh, arts in our nation? That's a good idea. Yeah, that. actually is. That's a good yep. idea. Please, yes. I, I think it's important that everybody that runs an organization like that reaches out. You know, I, I think that I don't know what it is about about our people sometimes that we don't ask for help enough. 
Right. We have to, you, you literally have to be willing to go no a thousand times and keep asking. But we, like someone had to teach me how to ask for help. Like I would just never, like my ego wouldn't allow it. You know, but you got to talk to five good people. Like all these people in this room are all going through something similar to you or they have one little thing that might help you get to the next thing. But you just have to talk, share, talk, share, talk, share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I understand the importance of mentoring. That's that's part of why I decided to step up and, and work in these inner city communities. So, you know, I think the, the biggest gift of mentoring is giving the knowledge that you have and sharing it with somebody so they don't make the same mistakes. So I'm hoping you guys have, you know, entertained this meeting or that's working, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let me ask, uh, how many business persons do we have in the room who are operating businesses now? Just kind of stand up real fast. Very impressive, very impressive. How many individuals do we have in the room who would like to be an entrepreneur, who would like to be a business person, aspire to be a business person? Please stand up. Okay. How many business persons have what you believe is a really creative idea? that you are going to pursue. <laughs> How many people who have an idea that they would like to pursue have done their research mm -hmm. and understands the market and understands how to get capital, how to put it together uh, to move forward? How many have done their homework? <laughs> How many people have saved a little money so that they can have some skin in the game? <laughs> How many people have reached out to a financial institution to try and get access to capital and have been turned down? <laughs> Mr. Kevin Cohe? <laughs> One of the things we are involved in is support for black banks. We're losing them every day uh, for a whole lot of complicated reasons. Uh, but our desire is to strengthen them so that they will have the ability uh, to help you have access to capital. And I'm particularly interested in uh, this creative community and the ability of our banks to move in that direction uh, because I do believe uh, that our culture is such uh, that we have a lot uh, to offer in building wealth. And so, Mr. Cohe, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on you, but do you have any thoughts about what we can do uh, to get more access to capital, and what, how will and can the black banks get more positioned uh, to do that? Uh, well, the thing about capital is capital is always looking for a home. Uh, people who have money to invest want to invest that money. So they're not trying to keep capital away from you because the way they make money is to deploy capital. The key is being able to understand how capital works. First, you have to actually understand the difference between debt and equity as a starting point. And when you understand capital and how it works, there will be many, many people uh, looking to invest in your venture because that's the only way they make money. So don't think of capital as as an obstacle. If, if capital is really an obstacle, what you then have to do, is, as, as this gentleman talked about when he talked about evangelizing your idea and nobody checking for it, you have to ask yourself, is it your idea? Banks, investment banks, venture capital, all they do is look to deploy money. And so what I'd like to see us do as a community is to become more educated about how capital works, how to talk the language of capital, 
how to create ideals the capital would check for. There's a very interesting phenomenon going on amongst all of us that presents probably, I believe, the most unique opportunity that I've seen in my over 30 years being a banker. And um, uh, Charlemagne the God, he, he, calls, he calls it black privilege. And, and understanding black privilege is a very important thing. There are things that we all have in common. We're united by the fact that we're black. That gives us a unique understanding of our of the thing of the products and services that we need. And what technology has done is it's given us the opportunity to reach each other in a way that never existed before. Black privilege, understanding black privilege and understanding technology and how to market, how to do social media marketing, that's gonna create many, many black millionaires. That's gonna create more black millionaires than anything that black people have ever done. So we're in an unprecedented time of opportunity. Understand your people, understand our unique needs, understand how to segment, how to reach. You can now reach across the country to people who are like-minded, and all of us are like-minded, and that is opportunity. That's what black privilege is all about. All right, okay. All right. And so we just have a short period of time before Sean Combs will uh, be present. And what we would like to do is um, we're going to have a video that we're going to show right before he comes out. Uh, we're not quite ready to do that yet. And so what I'd like to do is spend a little bit more time uh, engaging you uh, prior to his presence here on the stage. And so I think what I'm going to do is uh, pose some very difficult questions to you. I am often approached by those who say, Sean Combs and Jay-Z and Dre, they have all this money. Why can't we get some of it? <laughs> and basically I say because it's their money. <laughs> and people do with their money what they want to do, but we fail to recognize the philanthropy that many of them are involved in. And so, let me just talk about some of the projects and some of the funding that you've been involved in. Would you like to start? Yes, um, we, we're really excited, and actually I'll punt it to you, Derek, in a moment, mm -hmm. but um, uh, Sean just opened a school uh, in Harlem called Capital Prep. Um, we, um, this is again, um, there's a pattern you'll see that whatever is like the craziest, biggest thing is what uh, Sean endeavors to do because again, all advice was, oh, don't start a school from scratch. Like the amount of work and regulatory challenges um, will be prohibitive if you start a program, start an after school program, absolutely not. I want to start an actual school in Harlem to help the children that live in the area that I grew up. And that school is up and running. Uh, we just got our first year book, which I looked at, I don't know how to tear my eye when I saw it. Um, so, I, you know, we need, we all, you know, we need help and we need you guys support. Again, it's Capital Prep, please check it out. We do a ton of other um, activities for character building. We've been involved in, uh, we just recently did support for um, the people who were affected in, actually just today, sent out a bunch of stuff in Mexico, Puerto Rico, a couple weeks ago, for Florida and Texas. Um, we donated for Red Cross, we have the Daddy's House program. So I mean, he's, Sean is involved like literally day by day, Frank, and honestly increasingly so, now it's like hour by hour in outreach, whether it's financial or through resources um, through our internship program. But our school has been our most recent love project and it's kind of our heartbeat. And I could, Derek, if you, Derek is chair and was an instrumental in making it, uh, chair of the board for the school and making it happen. Yes, um, there's no problem uh, as big as the education problem we have right now for our kids in our neighborhoods. It is way beyond anything I ever imagined. Uh, sitting uh, in, in that chair um, and starting the school, even hearing it, you don't really understand what it is. So our school started uh, with sixth and seventh graders, and the way it works is you have to apply to the school. Uh, it's a lottery system and so on. So we get a random pool of children from the New York City uh, school system. 
the average child came to the school three grade levels behind in sixth grade. And there were some that were five grade levels behind. Uh, and, you know, honestly what, so Steve, Dr. Steve Perry is, uh, you know, is, is uh, who Sean partnered up with to launch the school. And very simply, the difference I found in uh, what we provide or what Dr. Steve Perry's model, because I kept asking him, he's had 100% graduation rate for all the schools he's been involved in, 100% college, uh, uh, four-year college rate, placement rate. And I just kept asking, how do you do it, how do you do it? And the reality is from day one when the kids walked into the school, it's just a different level of caring about them, right? So, you know, it, it, so that's A, it's like a different level of care. How do you present yourself? How do you look when you walk in the building? In Capital Prep, you walk in the building, you're disheveled, you're gonna get stopped, pulled aside, very gently, <coughs> Very, you know, parentally, like, okay, let me fix your tie. We want you to be great today. You know, let, let me, you gotta enter the building right. The second thing is that you just gotta catch up, right? If you're two to three years behind, uh, you know, so we have only three weeks off of the year. Uh, school is year round except for three weeks. We have after school. We just started Saturday school, literally nine to five school on Saturday. Because if you're three grade levels behind, you're gonna need that time to catch up. So all of this is to say it's a big endeavor of ours uh, since I've been with uh, Combs Enterprises, starting with uh, Sister Soldier, who someone mentioned uh, earlier, uh, who, uh, who was running our Daddy's House social programs. You know, touching uh, communi our community and the needs of our community has been something near and dear to the heart of Sean Combs, but I think education, when he just looked at the statistics, he was pretty much like, we're gonna disappear if we don't solve this problem. And I would argue that uh, you know there are a lot of there's a long list of issues but if we don't get education right we won't have anybody to fill these seats 10 years from now thank you so very much the other uh, kind of question or statements that I hear aside from you know wanting uh, the money of the uh, hip-hop moguls and the basketball and football stars etc is I called or I wrote a letter and I wanted Sean to come to my graduation, and he didn't come. Uh, and I asked him uh, to show up uh, at this big community event that we were doing, and it's not that far from him. He could have just come over there. Will you talk about the schedule of something like Sean going? Yeah, I, I, and I did on the that schedule. Part, I need to take, <laughs> take a restroom break. Hold oh, on. Okay. I'll be right back. Because uh, um, I, I used to actually do Sean's schedule, right? So okay. I can really talk right. about okay. this. Because <laughs> um, the reality of being successful at this amount of things at the same time um, requires like right, just we'll a ruthless dedication the bath. every minute. I'm personally a person who's very obsessed with like Is there a restaurant every one? day. Like I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna take about six and a half minutes to do this. And, and I know that if I wanna be successful everything I'm doing, I gotta so we need to walk that way to go to restaurant? Hours. So you talk about a short order right, or right, we'll Drake around. or you know, President Obama, like these sure. people's schedules are insane. So even for me personally, having been working for Sean for 12 years, I don't, I'm never asking, I'm not even asking to come to my wedding because I'm like, if he got an extra four hours, I want him to spend it with his six kids. And I think, I'm hopeful that the people who are asking those questions, that you're valuing your time in the same way. One thing I talk about quite a bit is yeah. that I hear so many young people talking about the future and the past, mm -hmm. but it is always yeah. only one day. Totally. Today. Right. So and it's about your one. time of today right. and value these people, because right. you want them doing things that are right. generationally impactful, right? I, don't come to my, I'm gonna handle my community barbecue. I want, I want President Obama out changing the entire world. <coughs> and let me change my community, unless somebody change their block. Okay, which way? All right, now, here's my. We're going to start the video, and Sean Combs will be in shortly. So toward the end of the video, if you would like to stand so you can stretch your legs, don't start moving. Out, because you want to go get a drink of water. Don't exchange rows because you want a better seat. If you stand in place, and by the time he comes in, we can get started. Can you do that for me? Okay, the video is about to start. Thank you very much. Give the panel another big round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. You did a fantastic job. Thank you so very much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Sean Diddy Combs. I'm so pleased he's with us today, and we're so proud of his accomplishments, his entrepreneurship, everything about him. He is the definition of a mogul. As chairman and CEO of Combs Enterprises, he has a diverse portfolio of businesses and investments covering the music, fashion, fragrance, beverage, marketing, film, television, and media industries with companies such as Bad Boy Worldwide Entertainment Group, Sean John Combs Wine and Spirits, AQU, The Blue Flame Agency, Revolt Films and Revolt Media and TV and on and on and on. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. After you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But before I sit down, yes. I just wanted to say thank y'all for having me. It's my first time here. Um, I've, I've always wanted to come, you know, just being from Howard University, HU. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to take the time to thank you, Queen Waters, for all that you have done to, to, to even make all of those businesses possible. You know, it couldn't have been done without you, so thank wow. you. Thank you so very, very much. Mm. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I, 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 we want to know so much about how you have come to this point in your life. We're so proud of you. And I guess the first thing to ask is, um, this is this question may even be unfair. Do you know how important you are to all of us? Uh, um, with, 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 with success and the support from your community um, comes a, a responsibility. And you know, like when you're younger, you, you kind of like running from that responsibility. And um, at this point, I know how important I am. Yeah. And I know that I'm ready for the responsibility to lead. I'm ready for the responsibility to teach. And it's something I embrace and I'm proud of and I give all glory to God that I even had the opportunity to, to make a change. So, you know, through God, and my faith in God, I'm very, very clear on how important I am, most importantly, how important and powerful we are as a community. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Why did you believe you could be successful? Outside, we know, and everybody knows, how talented you are, and uh, that you're one of the greatest performers in the world, and all of that, but how did you know you could be successful in business? I knew I could be successful in business because um, one morning I woke up and I had these roaches crawling on my face. <laughs> and I know a lot of us have experienced that. And I was like, um, no, I don't like this right here. This is not, this is not gonna be my reality. And I just, I, I, I knew I was ready to put in the work at a, at a very, very young age because I, I wanted to change. I wanted to be accountable and responsible for my future. I didn't want to have it in nobody else's hands. I didn't want to ask for nothing. I wanted, I knew that in order for me to make sure that my kids didn't have to experience the roaches, you know, I had to go out and I had to make something happen. So I, I didn't know I was going to be a successful businessman, um, but I, I, I knew that I, I had the work ethic, and I knew that I was ready to do um, what it took. I had this thing, um, this quote, don't be afraid to close your eyes and dream, but then open your eyes and see. So I, 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 I dreamt about being this, but I dealt with the reality of what it would take. It took a lot of sacrificing, you know. <laughs> couldn't hang out with, with my friends all the time. I couldn't be on the corner. I couldn't, I didn't have time to play. It was, to me, it was a very serious, situation and so um, I think it's that it's that passion and, and, and that drive 
but I educated myself about the businesses that I would go into. I didn't go blindly. I didn't go and wake up and say, oh, I'm going to be the next Barry Gordy. I studied Barry Gordy. I went and studied music. I read books about the business of music. I empowered myself with the knowledge. I, I, I viewed myself that I'm going to be in a boardroom with um, some, some very educated and, and, and um, experienced um, white men. Mm -hmm. This is the time, I'm, and I was like, I have to be able to to compete, mm -hmm. and I have to be able to be greater. And so, um, empowering that and understanding that, that that put me on my mission. And I knew from that, um, you know, that 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 I had the potential for success. Wow. So, talking about education, you attended Howard University. Yes. Was that a good experience? Ain't <laughs> <Hey>, you? <laughs> <laughs> um, as long as I know y'all in the house, I can relax. I don't do a lot of public speaking. You know? Anybody that goes to Howard University, they know that it's, 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 for some of us, I didn't have a big family. So for some of us, it's the first time we really get to experience family. So that was the first thing. And, and you know, I'm, going to Howard, it, it, it changed my life. Um, my dream of, of, of being in the music industry, I couldn't have done it without, you know, my family at Howard University because I, I got a chance to get an internship with Andre Harrell um, working for free. And where you at, Dre? <laughs> working for free. And I, I would have to take the train, you know, every Thursday and be back to school by Monday. But my schoolwork on Thursday and Friday, um, you know, I, I had to be covered and supported by my, my teachers mm -hmm. and um, my fellow students. And I would walk around the campus and and um, with my briefcase, and I would be like, yeah, I'm going to be real big in the music industry. I, I'm going to manage people. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the next Barry Gordy. And they didn't really think I was crazy. They, they saw in my eyes that, you know, I had something there. And so that, that support. If I was anywhere else, I wouldn't have gotten that support. I wouldn't have been able to do that. So that, that, that support um, you know, empowered me to be able to get the opportunity to, to go and learn um, and, pursue, and pursue my true dream. You, know, you may have a true dream, um, but you may be taking philosophy. But that's not really your dream. So when I went to Howard, I was like, my dream is music. I want to understand the business side from Howard. Then I want to go into the record industry and get some hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. And I was only able to do that through my Howard family. Wow. Well, you know, um, I've talked to many talented individuals. And some tell me that I've always known when I was two, I was three years old, I was trying to sing, I was trying to dance. And others would say, other people would tell me, I see something in that child. I think that child has talent. When did you discover you had talent? I would probably say when my dream got deferred, I, I, I knew I was going to be a, a, a pro NFL football player. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> He's cracking up, my man right there. Is like <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, my dream got deferred. I broke my leg in, in, my, last, in my last year. And um, like I, I kind of got abandoned by the coaches and um, the system, and it kind of broke my heart. And then I went like into like this, you know, minor depression that we all go through when we hit the low points. And um, you know, I kind of danced my way out of it. This is during when the, when the club scene was really kind of rocking because you had like um, house music and DC and go go, and you had hip hop. All of this, all of these beautiful black different categories of artistry, you know, shining, and, um, and I started dancing, and I, I started dancing because, you know, I wanted the girls to like me, <laughs> and um, I started getting recruited um, by casting directors for videos, and, you know, um, once I hit the front of that camera, I felt so at home. You know, like that red light, it didn't scare me. The spotlight was hitting me. I was like, this is where I belong. Um, but, but, but I was, um, I was blindsided 
by the visual of what was going on behind it, what, what was going on behind the camera. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Andre Harrell walk in and he had on a suit and um, he was an owner in a company and, and, and I saw all the artists, you know, you know, looking up to him and talking to him. And I was like, I really think that's what I want to do. Oh, I really think that's what, what I want to be. And so, you know, it was, I started out as that. And, um, you know, as far as getting as an artist, Biggie kind of pushed me. He didn't really have to push me hard. He kind of just said, you don't have to get off the stage and, <laughs> and let me rock with him. <laughs> and so um, that's how I became an artist. But I, I just, I felt that, I, I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew I had, I knew, I knew I had some special magic. I knew I had some special powers. And I don't think like I'm unique. I think we're, um, a lot of us are afraid to tap into those powers, almost like Superman. Yeah. We, we know before he could fly, he was like, I don't want, I'm scared, you know, yeah, yeah. to fly. But we have, like when they say that black magic, like it's really real. And it's not like, there's not one of us that's more special. You know, you're special is what you believe and what's in your mind. So I just started believing the craziest, to most people, unattainable things that have um, got me to this point, but I didn't just start thinking about them. I, I was really, you know, manifesting them. I was tapping into my magic. I was tapping into this black spiritual power in my relationship with God, and I was just like, oh, I'm invincible. I could do anything, you know, through God. Wow. <laughs> You were also paying attention to, as you said, the business aspect of entertainment. You saw Andre in that suit, or that briefcase. And so business has been on your mind for a long time. Yes. Um, I remember when I first went to a meeting with Andre Harrell, I had wore this white shirt and this polka dot tie. And excuse me, this is during the time when um, we weren't really wearing a lot of suits. That era was like it was like a little different. Hip hop was coming in, and we were expressing ourselves, you know, through fashion, the way we express ourselves. Um, but I kind of understood I needed to go from the block to the boardroom in the same day, and I understood that that if I went into an interview, I was presenting myself, I was presenting my brand, but most importantly, I was presenting my family name and my mother and my grandmother. And so, you know, I used to have to. Um, I went to I went to a Catholic school. Um, but and I was an altar boy, and then I had to go to the to the to the eleven o'clock service at, at Shiloh Baptist Church with my grandmother, and then I was dead to like midnight. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, and so like I, I knew about you know wearing a suit and presenting myself and 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 looking and feeling the part, you know that the role that that, that I wanted to play. So. You know, from, from an early age, my briefcase was in hand, and I was, I was, I was, I was living out the dream, and I was, I was making it happen visually through my actions. So, what was your very first business that you either acquired, um, joint ventured, or you invested in? What was that very first business? That, uh, yeah. um, my very first business was I had a franchise of paper routes. Um, one day, um, I asked my mother to get me some sneakers, and, and she, she didn't have the money for it. So I saw like this, this real look of disappointment on her face. And she's a very, very strong black woman. And um, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to see that look on her face anymore. And so I felt like it's time for, I'm, I'm only 12, but I, I could start to step up as a man. I don't have to, I'll come and support my mother. You know, I have two legs and, and and arms, I'm healthy, and I have a mind, and, and but I, you couldn't work at the age of 12. You know, it was illegal to work at the age of 12 and have a paper route. And so I went and um, contacted the different paper boys that I knew were graduating and going to college. And um, I presented them with an offer, let me, while you're in college, deliver your papers, and I'll send you half the money. Wow. And then, yeah, and then so I got like two, two, three, four, five, six paper routes. Okay. And um, you know, I franchised it from there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my 
mother, she just makes she makes sure that I I, I keep buying her shoes. <laughs> she remembers that sneaker situation, so you know, and I make you know, and it, it's, it's it's been you know it's been great. That was my first business ever since. It taught me about you know ownership. It taught me about customer service. If any of you have um, seen, uh, I mean, yeah, um, it was I, when I would deliver papers, and this I would deliver to a lot of elderly clients and um, the paper boys would just throw them on the lawn. They would just ride by in their car and you would flip it while you're driving and just throw it on the lawn. Um, I actually would go and put it in between the screen door and, uh, and the door because I didn't want them to walk outside. Oh. And so that, that attention to detail and that extra caring and um, kind of taught me customer service at an early age. Wow, that's, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Number one, I'm only really challenged to go into industries where I feel like I can actually change the game and I can um, actually, you know, break down barriers. And so when I went into fashion, that was something that, you know, people thought was really crazy. You know, I went to, started doing my shows in Fashion Week in New York and, you know, I was unapologetically black in hip hop and this is during the time where you know um, everything is all white in fashion like every last thing and and I, and I, I believed in the power of, 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 of the community I believed in the power of hip hop I saw it as this multi-billion dollar business I saw it as it is today um, but I knew that I could only get into things that I, I felt I could I could be great at you know I it's not about making money for me as much as it is as far as like, like me being great and being able to change the game and create opportunities. And so like when I did that with fashion and then I went, um, I mean, I did it with, with records in the music industry um, as far as understanding ownership. Um, that was a big thing for me. And that's, that's a big thing for me to express here. The only way we are gonna change um, our course is is, is, is by under, being fearless enough to become owners, mm -hmm. to be able to handle that responsibility, to be able to take that risk. Um, because I'm, I'm sitting here because I got fired. Um, anybody out there that got fired? <laughs> okay. so, um, and, and, and I didn't want to get fired again, and I wanted to be in control of, of my, you know, my destiny. So, you know, went into records and um, fashion, then went into spirits, and now my biggest venture is 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 in media, because we don't have a voice. Um, I, you know, I'm proud to say it, and um, that I'm proud, but it's, it's it's also troubling to say that I'm the only African American majority owner of a network. You know, um, there's. I have other brothers and sisters that you know have networks, but this is, it's just different when you when you have the final say, because I, I don't have to censor. So if we have an issue and we want to talk about it, I don't have Viacom calling me. I don't have nobody calling me to 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 tell me, oh that you went too far. I just feel like we haven't gone far enough as far as, and but we also haven't had the platform or a voice, and so that's what I want to do with Revolt. And, um, you know, and, and that kind of speaks to the industries, those different industries I went in, I was motivated by making change and creating opportunities, and I, you know, um, hiring a lot of black folk. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, um, you have alluded to it, but I'd like you to, um, to speak to it a little bit more. How important is it uh, for entrepreneurship in the black community, for us to own business, that is really important. Why do we just have to get a job? Uh, um, if we want to stay in the same condition that we've been in, because you, 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 you have been a freedom fighter for us for a long time. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> and one of
one of your things that you recognized early on that I don't, I don't think we pay enough attention to um, is, you know, is, is, is our economic power, you know? And the only way for us to make it out of this condition, number one, is, is, is time for us to come together as a family real quick and start looking at each other as a family, as a tribe and that we are self-supportive and we do business with each other and we hire each other and we, and we empower each other. And I think entrepreneurialism is really the, the, one of the um, solutions to poverty because it's a place where if you're really, really, really ready to get busy, you could control your own destiny and you, and, and you, can, um, you can make money because nothing's gonna change without money. You know, um, you know, I, I respect a lot of the protests and, and, and everybody that, that really, you know, stands up for everything that's going on. But the only way we're going to really make some changes is by really building up our own economic system. We only have 1% of the wealth in this country. And, that's just, and when we got free slaves, we had 1% of the wealth. So I'm here to change that. And y'all are here to change that too. You have uh, been able to attract attention to just your style. That uh, your style has helped to um, enhance, broaden, uh, develop businesses that have been around like spirits, for example. Because of your style, you have taken that business to a new level and was talked about a little bit today. How do you describe your style? I'm from Harlem, New York. <laughs> I'm from Harlem. I love, I, I love being clean. I love like, you know, um, I love expressing myself through fashion. Um, you know, I love really, really um, being well put together. I like to look like money. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel like you attract what you look like, you know, and, um... <laughs> all right, okay, all right. Uh, well, you know, we have a lot of young uh, people in the audience, and many uh, want to be entrepreneurs, and many have thoughts, uh, but they have not pursued them. And do you think that uh, everybody, or many people, have some kind of uniqueness, that if they just tap into it and, and be positive, uh, about the possibility for development, that that uniqueness can turn into business or to money or to profits, to success. Do you, do you believe that? No. No? No. Um, what, what does it take? Um, for us to really come up and for anybody in here to be a, a, a successful businessman or woman that can really make a difference, it's, 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 it's a lot, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work. Um, I think, I, I think um, Will Smith has said that, that it's, it's, it's not his talent, you know, that makes him special. It's, it's his dedication and his preparation. And so I feel like a lot of people, you have that thing. Yes, we have that magic, but what you gonna do with it? Are you ready to go past that and really do the work that it takes? Because when you, when, you, you're hitting those books, you're in search for those, that information, like your uniqueness, if you could do something, you, that, that, that doesn't come to help you. Like we, we're, we're all, we, 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 we all have to go through the same thing to kind of get to where we need to get to. And I, I, I think that if, if, if we focus on the work that it's gonna take, um, sometimes we do focus on how special we are and things like that, and you know, and I know I'm up here speaking, confidently, um, but there's nothing too, too, too like small for me to do. There, there's, I don't have no ego when it comes to business. I may have an ego with my style of dress, but when it comes to business, I don't have no ego. Like if I have to clean the kitchen, pick something up. I started from cleaning 
gas station bathrooms in the heat wave back in the days. And I, I just wanted to make sure that they, you know, everybody been to a gas station bathroom and, and it's the worst. It's, it's, it's just, I, I just can't believe it. And so I was in charge of cleaning the bathrooms. And my thing was that I wanted to have that bathroom so clean that I would actually watch people ask me, um, where's the bathroom? I'm like, right over there, sir, to the right. And they would come out and be like, who cleaned that bathroom? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, you, got, you, you have to be ready to do that. You can't, you can't, you can't have that ego. You, can't, you, you, you have to make sure that you're ready to start off small. So I started off working for free. And so a lot of people don't understand that they want to be businessmen and women, but they want to get straight to a job when you really need to get straight to the knowledge and the experience and get under somebody that can teach you. And so what is the greatest obstacle that you have encountered um, on your ladder to success? Um, the business answer is time and money. The real answer is racism. And would you say that there are those who actively blocked some opportunity that you were pursuing, who ignored uh, some requests that you were making, mm -hmm. who actively worked against your being able to do something, how did that play itself out? I really disconnected from the, 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 the ra racism. I really didn't have no time for whatever they was thinking. Mm -hmm. I had to, um, you know, I, it, it, you were saying a challenge. It was yes. just, a, it, it's just a challenge. Okay. Yes. You know, it's just a challenge. It wasn't something that was going to stop me. Right. Nobody's going to stop me. Nobody's going to get in my way. I, I, I kind of tell people like you know if it's that 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 kind of um, put me in that position because there's people that put you in that position and they'll be in the same room with you and I'm like I need you to understand that if it's between me and you getting out this room and you're in the way of the door I will eat through your stomach and come out the other side. Yeah, it's that real. It's that real. You have to be ready to get graphic. <laughs> It's a challenge, and we know, we know that it is, and you have to have good people and dedicated people and committed people and people who are willing to work hard. What do you look for in an employer? I look for accountability. You know, I look for people that's really ready to be responsible. I need people around me that I can trust um, to, to get the task done. I need people that I can trust to be able to fail and fall down, but to be able to have the strength to get back up. Um, so I really look for that, that tenacious spirit. And I, I really look for also intelligence. I want to work with, with smart people, you know? And um, I can't go any further. None of us can go any further. We can't go to another level alone so you know I'm as strong as as the team that's around me and um, I would like y'all to give my team a round of applause they spoke oh, yeah. and so ladies and gentlemen you've heard from Sean Combs himself give him a big round of applause thank you thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any last words you'd like to share with this audience um, uh, as we exit? Um, I, I, I know. I know that we talked about and and we 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 had a we had a lot of yeah. We go take a seat real quick. Yeah.
sharing some last words with us. Um, you have a son that was at UCLA. Yes. On his way to Harvard. Yes. Is he in the room? Yes. Justin's in the room. Stand up, my son Justin. <laughs> They didn't see you in the back. You got to take your time with it. Turn around. <laughs> Let them see you, baby. Um, um, I know we had the Black Caucus, and you know, we, we, we talking about we 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 talking about the situation that we in. We we're, we're trying to find solutions. Um, we can't come here three years from now talking about the same thing. Okay. Everybody in here is going to have to leave this room and play a major, major, major role. Don't look up here like we're special, you know? Um, you have a responsibility. No matter how small the role is, the only way we're going to make it about this condition is, is to work together. We are in a, a beyond state of emergency. We don't even count. We don't even get covered on the news, you know? Um, you know, people are waking up, but we have to, we have to um, be, be a part of waking people up. If you got 20 friends and you here woke, you can't have your 20 friends not woke. You know, because um, right now it's bigger than us in here. We have an opportunity right now um, because of the times where we could communicate faster to each other. We can mobilize with each other. We can get on the same page through social media. Mm -hmm. Right now, we, we, we use it for a lot of different things, and it's fun, and it's cute. But in the future, we're going to have to come together. And we're going to need leaders. And there's some people in here that I'm a great soldier first, you know? Um, but no matter what, I'm, go I'm, 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 I'm going to, to lead the charge. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I would say is that, you know, we're in a very serious time, and, but, but we're in a position where, where we're, we're about to start to reach our greatness and our unapologetic magic. Mm -hmm. And y'all have a responsibility in that. I have a responsibility. And um, it's very important that we take the conversation and turn it into action and results. And I just want to tell y'all, thank y'all for coming out. Y'all wow. can do it. I love y'all. Thanks for the support on everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have an announcement to make. Thank you so very, very much. Is this wonderful or what? <laughs> thank you.